There is power in the blood. Psalm 19, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And that is just absolutely true. And all of us have experienced that very thing. We've looked up and looked around, and we've seen God's amazing creation. And we just have to glorify Him for that. Have you looked up into the nighttime sky and looked at the host of heaven, all the stars? Really, truly innumerable. You know, here in planet Earth, we are in the Milky Way galaxy. And they say... Of course, they don't know because they can't even count them all, but they say there must be about 300 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. You know, our star is just one of them. Our sun is just one of those stars. There may be as many as 300 billion stars in just our Milky Way galaxy. And they furthermore tell us that there may be as many as 100 billion galaxies out there. Can you imagine that? That's just unimaginable, isn't it? And God spoke all of that into, into existence with the power of his word. Incredible, just incredible, the power of God and his creative work. You know, when we think of God's creation, often we think about things on the massive scale. I know that many of you have been up to the Smoky Mountains in East Tennessee. We love those Smoky Mountains uh, for many years. Uh, I lived and preached with my family in uh, and we lived in Knoxville, Tennessee. We spent a lot of time up in the Smokies. We loved the Smoky Mountains. They're just so beautiful. On, on multiple occasions, we had a chance, my sons and I, to go out into the Wyoming and hike way up in the Rocky Mountains. And the Rocky Mountains are an entirely different kind of mountain, but they are beautiful as well. Uh, just God's amazing creative work seen on the big, grand scale of the things that he has made. You see the power of God in the big things he made, but could I suggest to you tonight that you can also see the power of God in the tiny, even microscopic things that he has made. If you were hiking up in the Smoky Mountains some spring day along one of the many trails there, and the wildflowers just blooming in abundance, if you stopped and picked one of those wildflowers and looked at it, it would be perfect. Here in these massive mountains, a tiny wildflower, and it's perfect. But you know what you, you know what you could do? If you began to peel back the petals of that wildflower, as you looked at the internal parts of that wildflower, you'd see that's perfect too. That's really perfect. You know what you could do? You could take that wildflower and you could go into a laboratory and you could take the the wildflower and put it under a a powerful microscope. Uh, and you know, as you increase the power of magnification, you know what you'd see? You'd see more and more perfection. You know, men have developed microscopes now that they can even see things clear down on the single cellular level. And if you looked at that wildflower under that most intense magnification, the closer you look, the more and more perfection that you would find. Okay, now hang on to that for a minute because I want to suggest a test to you. First part of the test is this. If God made it, it's perfect. No matter how you look at it. If you look at it on the big grand scale, if you look at it on the tiny microscopic scale, if God made it, no matter how closely you look at it, it is perfect. On the other hand, if man made it, that's not so. For instance, let me, let, let me use my watch here as an illustration. I want you to imagine that this is an expensive Rolex watch. It's not. <laughs> it's a 995 Walmart watch. But uh, just imagine, use, you use the power of your imagination for a minute. Imagine this is an expensive Rolex watch. What if we took it apart? I'll tell you, if you had a Rolex watch, it probably wouldn't be a wise thing to take it apart. Let's take it apart. You know, this may be the finest workmanship that men are capable of doing, a Rolex watch, and we take it apart. But when we take it apart, it looks pretty impressive, you know, all the working parts of that watch. But you know what would happen? If we began to put those parts under the microscope, you know what would finally happen as you upped the power of magnification? Those little pins and points in there would begin to look like blunt stakes. 
and those highly polished surfaces would begin to look like the cratered surface of the moon if man made it and you begin to scrutinize it carefully you will begin at some point to finally see flaws in it okay so that's a test that I want to suggest to you tonight if God made it I don't care how closely you look at it it's perfect if man made it and you look at it closely enough you will see the flaws okay now I want us to apply that test to the Bible tonight. Do a little exercise uh, that I think might be uh, helpful to us to strengthen and encourage our faith. We want to put the Bible under the microscope for a few minutes tonight. Thanks for being here. We appreciate you very much and draw strength and encouragement by uh, being here together tonight. And we're glad that you're here to be a part of it. As we've been saying right along this week, as we study together, if there's any question, if you have any concerns, if, if there's even any something you maybe don't agree with, by all means, please say a word so we can sit down together and study that through. We believe it's absolutely possible and necessary to understand the Bible and to understand it alike. And we believe that's absolutely possible. So if there's any question, by all means, please ask it. Okay, for our exercise tonight, what I want you to do is turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. Now this is a passage that we very often are tempted to, to sort of skip over. Genesis chapter 5 uh, is one of those passages where it's just a list of men, uh, how long they lived, their sons, how long they lived, and we call it a genealogy, right? Uh, and and the, the, the names are oftentimes hard to pronounce and we're just, we're just sort of tempted to skip over this section and go to the next chapter. But tonight, I want you to spend a little time with me in Genesis chapter 5. And I want you to begin reading with me at verse 21. We're, gonna, we're not we're going to take the whole genealogy, but we'll just start sort of here in the middle. Genesis 5, verse 21. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God. He was not, for God took him. And Methuselah lived 180 and seven years and begat Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 780 and two years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years and he died. And Lamech lived 180 and two years and begat a son called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And Lamech lived after he begat Noah 590 and five years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years and he died. And Noah was 500 years old and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well, you know, as we read that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it obviously has the names of these men and gives their ages when certain things happen. And that's what I want to particularly investigate with you tonight. I want to put up here sort of a spreadsheet, if you will, and we want to do a little calculating about the dates and the ages given concerning these four men in that genealogy of Genesis chapter 5. Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. All right, so work with me here. and it, uh, You may want to get out your, your smartphone or, or something and, and make sure that I've got my numbers calculated accurately because we're going to do a little math here, a little of some very simple math. In verse 21, as it starts out, it speaks of Enoch. He says he lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. So on our spreadsheet here, Verse 21, Genesis 5, 21, Enoch was 65 when Methuselah was born. And, of course, Lamech and Noah haven't shown up on the scene yet. All right, now, Enoch's son was named Methuselah. Right? Now, you know that name. You've heard of Methuselah. We'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute. But Methuselah, even in a list of rather odd names to us, these are not names that we would typically hear, but even in a list of rather odd names, the name Methuselah sort of stands out above the rest. But you know, of course, that back in those times when P 
people had children, they named them names that meant something. And we don't do that anymore, right? We just pick out a name that we like and we name our kids that. We probably don't have any, any clue as to what the name may mean. But back then they did. Names had significance. So Enoch names his son Methuselah, kind of odd. According to the Hebrew scholar Thomas Newberry, the name Methuselah means when he is gone, it will be sent, or when he dies, it will come. Well, that's weird. That was a weird thing to name a son. Something about Enoch. Another little fact that we need to throw in the mix about Enoch is from the New Testament. In Jude, in the book of Jude, at verse 14, it says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and so on it goes. I just want to reference Jude, verse 14 in particular, because it says that Enoch was a prophet. Enoch was a prophet, and he named his son Methuselah. When he dies, it will come. When he is gone, it will be sent. Something of that nature, according to the Hebrew scholar Thomas Newberry. Now, if you check up on that, you may not find that, that same answer from every source, but I've found multiple sources, sources that suggest that is the true meaning of the name Methuselah. Okay, hang on to that. You're probably already racing far ahead of me, I imagine. But, but hang on to that for a minute. All right, let's continue with our spreadsheet. In verse 25, read verse 25. Methuselah lived 180 and seven years and begat Lamech. So, I don't know if this pointer works on this guy or not. Yeah, it does. So, on our spreadsheet, it says that Methuselah was 187 when his son Lamech was born. Now, the text doesn't say so, but we can add, we can do a little simple addition here. We know that Enoch was 65 years older, so Enoch was 252 when his grandson Lamech was born. You see how that spreadsheet's going to work for us? We're just going to fill it out that way. All right, back up a verse, a couple of verses, 23. All the days of Enoch were 360 and five years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch is not the only one, but a very rare case of a person who did not experience physical death. He was just taken by God. Apparently a very good man and just taken by God. He, he walked God. He was taken. He was not. So he just was taken from the earth. But that happened. Notice there it says that that happened when he was 365 years old. I put a little exclamation mark there because that's unusual. That's not typical, right? But again, because we know the differences in ages, we can calculate the age of Methuselah. He was 65 years younger than his father, so he would have been 300 when that happened. We know that he was 187 years older than his son, so Lamech was 113 when that happened. And Noah hasn't appeared on the scene yet. All right, let's go to verse 28. In verse 28, it says, Lamech lived 180 and two years and begat a son and called his name Noah. All right, so Lamech now, 182, when his son Noah is born, right? Enoch is gone from the scene. Well, let's do another little bit of calculating here. We know from back here that Lamech, that, he, that Methuselah was 187 years older than Lamech. Lamech was 182 when Noah was born. That makes Methuselah 369 years old when his grandson Noah was born. Did you know Noah was Methuselah's grandson? All right. And we see the difference in their ages there. Now, we're almost done. I don't mean to weary you with this. We're almost done. Look at verse 31. In verse 31, it says, And all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years, and he died. All right, so we, now, we've got, now we've got Lamech's death, 777. Go back here. He was 182 years older than Noah, so Noah would have been 595 when his father died. 
Methuselah is still alive. Can you imagine? A guy lives to be 777 and his father outlives him. Methuselah is still alive. Again, we know the difference in their ages here. So we add 187 to 777. Methuselah was 964 years old when his son Lamech died. All right. Now, verse 27. Verse 27 says, And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. So we've got our last column filled out here. Methuselah was 969 years old when he died. Can you imagine that? Almost a thousand years old. 969 years old. Have you ever heard somebody referring to someone who's real old and say, Why? He's as old as Methuselah. <laughs> well, he may be old, but he's not near as old as Methuselah. Methuselah. Methuselah is the Bible character of record. Now, there may have been somebody that lived longer, but we don't know about it. In our Bibles, he is the oldest man of record, 969 years old. Now, the important part of this last column is right here. Scoot way back over here. Methuselah was 369 years older than Noah, his grandson. So if he died when he was 969 years old, Noah would have been 600 years old, right? Is that right? Is our math right? It's not complicated math, is it? We can, we can do that pretty quickly. Now, again, I know that you've probably raced far, far ahead of me. What happened when Noah was, seven, was 600 years old? What happened in Noah's 600th year? Look in chapter 7, Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. The flood came in Noah's 600th year. Almost a thousand years earlier, Enoch had actually issued a prophecy when he named his son Methuselah. When he is dead, it will come. When he is gone, it will be sent. Almost a thousand years earlier, the prophet Enoch had prophesied the coming of Noah's flood. Is that amazing to you? You know, I don't know how many times I had read through that genealogy in Genesis 5 without ever stopping to sort of add up the numbers and see what they said. But when we put this, this just one little section of the Bible, when we put this section of the Bible under the microscope and we crank up the power of magnification, what do we find? We find a little hidden perfection there in the text, don't we? You could read over it and never even notice it. But if you stop and magnify it, there it is. There's it. What would we expect? Well, if the Bible's from God, we would expect that perfection, right? If it was from, if there, if there was, if the numbers didn't add up, what if, what if the numbers didn't add? Maybe they were one or two years off. We'd say, oh, that's not so good. You know, it should be perfect if God made it. Maybe it's not from God. If it's got a flaw in it, maybe it's not from God. We don't have to worry about that because it is perfect. And we do see this little hidden gem of perfection there in a Bible text that, as I said earlier, we very often are tempted to just sort of skip over. The Bible is perfect. And that's a very important thing for us. And so I'd just like to, to draw some conclusions from that, some lessons that we can learn. First of all, this, this perfection of the Bible that's evidence for us. You know, we find the Bible to be perfect throughout. We've, we looked at just one little part tonight, and we found a hidden perfection. But we, we, we believe that, don't we? The Bible is perfect and completely free from error and contradiction. And that is an amazing thing. And we need to be ready to explain that to people. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and notes, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so we need to be ready to share evidence with others, to explain to them why we have such great confidence in the Bible, because it truly is from God, and it is His perfect revelation to mankind. 
You know, the Bible, this, this perfection of the Bible, this complete harmony and unity of the Bible is really one of the most powerful proofs that the Bible really is inspired by God. It's not made by man. If it was made by man, it would have errors in it. It's made by God, and it's perfect. Uh, that perfection, if we stop to analyze it, is really sort of mind-boggling. You know, the Bible was written by about 40 different human, and I, I don't want to call them authors because they didn't author it. The author of the Bible is God. I like to call them human penmen. They were men who wrote down what God wanted them to write down. And there were about 40 men. We have to say about because one or two places where we're not absolutely confident of who the human penman was. But those, those 40 writers of the Bible they, they lived over a long period of time. The oldest parts of our Bible were written about 1,500 years before Christ. The newest parts of our Bible are about 2,000 years old. So the Bible was written over a period of about 1,500 years by 40 different men. They lived in different places of the world. They didn't even all speak the same language. They came from a wide variety of social and economic backgrounds and educational backgrounds. They, it was a really a diverse group of men. But when you put their finished work together, complete harmony, no contradiction. How, how, could, how can you explain that? How could you possibly explain that? Well, the only explanation is because God was guiding the process by inspiration, right? That's the only answer. I'll tell you a little uh, episode that happened way, way back uh, when I was in high school. In U.S. history class, our U.S. history teacher was Mr. Goins. Mr. Goins, a great big mountain of a man. He was one of the football coaches and he was the wrestling coach. And we all liked Mr. Goins. You, we had him for U.S. history. And, and one day as we got into class and sat down and class had just barely got started, Suddenly, a man burst through the door, yelled out Mr. Goins' name, shot him with a pistol, turned and ran out. We were all just sitting there dumbfounded. We couldn't believe what we just saw. Nobody tried to get up and stop the, the assailant or anything. We were just dumbfounded. Mr. Goins let that sink in for about 10 seconds. He jumped to his feet and without explanation said, take a blank piece of paper and a pencil, write down everything you can remember about what you just saw. And we did that. And then he, he collected those papers and he began to read them. And it was actually hilarious. None of us agreed with one another. We all contradicted each other. Here were about 30 kids and we had all just seen exactly the same thing just moments before. And when we were called upon to write about it, we couldn't agree. We all disagreed. And then what was really interesting, he called the guy back in, uh, who, by the way, had used a starter's pistol rather than a real gun. And none of us had even accurately described the guy who did the shooting. And I'll tell you, in today's environment, you would never try an experiment like that in school. In schools today, they would throw you under the jailhouse if you tried a trick like that. But back, that was a different day, back, way back when I was in high school. But the point that I'm making is men on their own could not have possibly written in such perfect unity and harmony as the Bible writers did. We saw a little bit of that harmony in that text in Genesis 5 that we were looking at. But that harmony runs all through the Bible. You can look anywhere you want. You can increase the magnification, test the Bible any way you care to, and you're going to find it's perfect. If it was from man, it wouldn't be perfect, but it's from God, and it is perfect. And that's one of the powerful proofs, powerful evidences for us. But there's some other things. There's some great moral lessons to be learned from the business about God sending the flood in the days of Noah, predicted by Enoch when he named his son Methuselah. One of the things we see in this story is that God patiently waits for sinners to repent. In Genesis chapter three, verse three, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter six, verse three, the Lord said, "My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh." Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Focus in on that last phrase there. His days yet, still yet, his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. I think what is, the, is being 
implied there, or, or stated, plainly stated, I guess not really implied. God had made up his mind to send a judgment upon wicked mankind, but it, it seems clear that he's saying it's going to come 120 years from now. I'm going to send this, but I'm going to send it 120 years from now. The question might be asked, why? Why would he wait 120 years? I think part of that answer may very well be that it would take Noah that long to build the ark. You know, the, Noah's ark was the largest vessel ever constructed by man until sometime within the last hundred years. Now some of the great super tankers that carry oil across the oceans are bigger than Noah's ark was. But before that, no one had ever even attempted to make a vessel that large. I imagine some of you have been up to uh, northern Kentucky, Cincinnati area and visited the ark. They've built an ark up there, full-scale replica of the ark. I've not been, but I've talked to several people who have been. And all of them are impressed with just the physical size of that thing. Can you imagine being given a job like that to do without any advantage of the modern tools we would have at our disposal? It was an incredibly big job that Noah was assigned to do, and he did it so faithfully. But I think it's, it's not unreasonable to imagine that it may, in fact, have taken him that long to get the job done. But I tell you, there's another part to that story, too, or another part of answer to why did God wait 120 years. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, it says, The long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. And so part of that delay of time is ascribed to God's long-suffering nature. Add to that what Peter says in 2 Peter 2, verse 5. It says, God spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person. Notice, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So while Noah was building the ark, he was also preaching God's righteousness. And God, in his long-suffering nature, was waiting. He was waiting before he sent the punishment that he had determined that he was going to send. Noah was preaching righteousness, and so there was at least the hope that someone would repent at such preaching and be spared from the punishment that God was about to send. God is a long-suffering God. That nature of God is unchanged. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. There's that word again. He's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So that's the nature of God. It was true back in the days of Noah, and it's still true today that he's a long-suffering God. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He gives time and opportunity for repentance. But I want you to think about this. As God was waiting, and, and that's what that text said, uh, God was waiting while the ark was preparing. What else was happening? What else was happening while God was waiting? And Noah was building the ark. What else was happening? Methuselah was getting older. Right? Methuselah just kept getting older and older as God waited, as Noah prepared the ark. As God in his long-suffering patience waited, Methuselah kept getting older. Could it be? I'm just offering this as a potential. I couldn't prove it. Could it be that the reason Methuselah ended up being the oldest man ever was because of this long-suffering nature of God waiting hoping that some would repent at the preaching of Noah. So God patiently waits for sinners to repent. That's still true of God today. And so God gives us opportunity to repent. And it may be that you need to take advantage of that opportunity if you've never become a Christian. You need to think about that. God's giving you time. He's a long-suffering, patient God. He's given you time. Don't wait too long. You know, the men in the days of Noah waited too long. Don't wait too long. Maybe you're a Christian. You know that you've not been faithful to the Lord. You know you need to come back. And yet you've been postponing that, putting it off. Don't wait too long, right? God is a patient God. He waits for sinners to repent. But the follow-up point to that is that there is an ultimate end to his patience. He will at some point send the, the punishment, the judgment that he has promised. There is an end to his patience. Go back to Genesis 7, verse 21. I think we mentioned this verse the other day. Genesis 7, verse 21 says, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and cattle and beast, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man. 
God is a, is a patient God, but he's also a just God. And his justice demands that evil be punished. And he will ultimately send the punishment as he did in the days of Noah. We mentioned the other day, some people think God's too loving to ever punish anyone. They haven't read this verse, have they? Where ever, in the days of Noah's flood, every man with the exception of Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, eight people, only eight people in the whole world were spared. God is a God of justice. God will send punishment. Go back with me to that verse we just read, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The next verse says, but the day of the Lord will come. As a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And so it's very important for us to realize that there is a there is a, a day of judgment coming. God has always judged men, and God has always necessarily punished those who are disobedient and, and unrepentant. He did it in the days of Noah, and that same thing will happen again. There's a day of judgment coming, and we need to be aware of that and ready for it. And so what we would say is, finally... There's only one thing that really matters. And of course, what that one thing is, is being right with God. What are, you, what are you doing in your life right now that you view as really important? What, what are the really, maybe, what, what do you view as something super important that you're involved in? Maybe uh, at your job, uh, maybe with your family, uh, maybe at school, some of you kids as you study your, your, your subjects. You know, all of those things have some importance for sure, but in the final analysis, those things are all going to pass and be forgotten. Uh, you know, when, when you die, it won't be long before all about you has been forgotten. I thought about that, you know. Oh, think with me a minute about your, your ancestors. So go back to your father and mother. Okay, we know our fathers and mothers. We had two parents, right? Go back to their parents, your grandparents. Do you know your, did you know your grandparents? Do you know your grandparents? You have four grandparents, right? And most of us can recall and have memories related to our grandparents. So one generation parents, two generation grandparents. Go back three generations to your great grandparents. You had eight of those. You know your great-grandparents? Did you know them? You know anything about them? Can you tell me the names of your eight great-grandparents? I can't begin to. I can't even begin to. Now, there might be somebody here. Somebody typically will say, well, I, I, I did Ancestry.com. You know, I, I studied my genealogy. With the exception of those who may be really into genealogy studies, most of us can't even name our great grandparents. Is that a little bit scary? Because you know what? The, you know what? T take it now. We were looking backwards. Take it forward. So Cindy and I have four kids, and they all live close to us, and we love to be around them. And we have been blessed with thirteen grandkids, if you can believe it. And they are all nearby, and we get to see them often. I was telling Rodney today that we're, we've had a chance to do a little baseball coaching with some of the little ones. It's been so fun this spring to, to play softball and baseball and watch the kids play. My grandkids know me, and, uh, and I'm so glad. But if history repeats itself, now this is the part that gets hurtful. If history repeats itself, my grandchildren's children will not know me. In fact, there's a high probability that my grandchildren's children won't even know my name. Well, I'll tell you, that's kind of hurtful, isn't it? That's a little bit hurtful when you think about it that way, but that's what happens, right? We're just here for a little while, and we're dead and forgotten. Even our own descendants will forget us, won't even know our names, much less anything about us. Since that's the case then I submit to you that there's only one thing that really matters. In this world, the only thing that really matters is to live for God, to obey Him, to do His will. In 
Matthew chapter 24, Jesus referenced the days of Noah. We've been talking about that tonight. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, Jesus said, As the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not till the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. I think it's interesting. If you look at that, it says they didn't know until the flood came. Why didn't they know? Because they weren't listening, right? Noah was preaching God's righteousness. Noah was telling them about what judgment of God was coming. It says they didn't know, and the reason they didn't know is because they weren't paying attention. And the flood came and took them all away. Jesus said, we need to watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. We dare not be in the same condition that they were in, having ignored the warnings and being unprepared, unready when the Lord comes in judgment. What's your situation tonight? Have you obeyed that simple gospel plan of salvation? Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized for the remission of sins. Have you done that? If you have not, that's the most, that is the singularly most important decision of life. There's a lot of important things we have to decide to do in our lives. That decision is the most important one. To become a child of God, forgiven of past sins, in a right relationship with God and with the hope of heaven and eternity. If you've not done that, we urge you to make that decision without delay. If you're a Christian already, but you know that you've not been faithful to the Lord. Revelation 2 verse 10 says, Be thou faithful unto, de unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. And if you've not been faithful, we beg you to come back in repentance, confession, and prayer. If we can help, let us know while we stand.